You know, often at youth group, we do with the kids what we, we call highs and lows, and we talk about kind of what was your high point for the week, what was your low point for the week. Um, I, don't, I won't share my low, but I want to share my high with you guys today because it kind of goes to uh, what Pastor Anna was saying earlier about our preschool and what a blessing our preschool is to us. Um, and this week, uh, Miss Tammy was bringing her class of twos upstairs for recess, and they came a little early, and so they came by the office to say hi to me and Miss Doris, and uh, man, nothing brings joy to your heart like a gaggle of two-year-olds coming in, waving and smiling. <laughs> and so that was my high for the week this week. What a blessing uh, our preschool is to the life of our church. Our scripture for this morning comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verses 25 to 33. Hear the word of the Lord. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought, too. This is the word of God for us today, and our response is, thanks be to God. You know, growing up in a military family, if you you didn't know, my dad's a Marine. Um, He was uh, active for 10 years, but you know, once a Marine, always a Marine, all that. Um, But I've always been fascinated by military history, pretty much all things military. And one thing in particular that I've always thought was fascinating um, is naval ships. I just think they are so cool. And if if you like that sort of thing, you know, maybe you don't. You're like your big nerd and you'd be right. And I'm proud of it. Um, But if you like that sort of thing, you know that the king of all the ships is the aircraft carrier, right? Aircraft carriers are these massive ships that are just basically floating cities because of their sheer size and the the amount of personnel it takes to, to operate them. And I tell you, through the years... I've seen lots of pictures of aircraft carriers, but nothing beats when last year during our youth mission trip, we went to Charleston on our free day and got to tour the USS Yorktown, which was a a carrier that served in World War II in Korea and Vietnam. I'm telling you, walking towards this massive ship, it was absolutely mind-blowing, the sheer size of the massive hunk of steel that was floating there in the harbor. And as we toured the many levels of the Yorktown, it was clear that pictures could never do justice to just how massive these ships are. The USS Yorktown, a few facts you probably don't care about, but I'm going to give you anyway. It has a displacement of 36,380 tons and a length of 872 feet. Seeing a ship like that was truly, truly breathtaking. That being said, what surprised me maybe even more was uh, when I compared the size of the Yorktown to one of our modern aircraft carriers, the USS Gerald R. Ford, 
which has a displacement of 100,000 tons and a length of about 1,106 feet. That means that the carriers that we are currently using are nearly twice as long and almost three times as heavy as the one we toured in Charleston. Now, it's hard to imagine something of that size, that magnitude, without seeing it face to face. You know, the perspective of a photograph of something like that just can't do justice to the sheer size of it. And if you haven't seen an aircraft carrier, you can probably still think of all sorts of examples where perspective can really alter how we view things. You know, we live here near the airport, you know, the strangely named Cincinnati airport that's not in Cincinnati, right? Um, and we see lots of planes a lot closer than the average person probably does, especially if you go to somewhere like the aircraft viewing area at the airport. We could say there's a big difference between, between seeing a plane fly overhead at 30,000 feet versus seeing it zip above you and feel so massive and so close you feel like you could reach out and touch it, right? The kind of, when they're, they're fl- taken off over your house and your walls are shaking, you know, it's a lot different than that little speck up in the sky. Same plane, different perspective. Our perspective on anything in life affects how we see the world around us and how we see the things in it. Of course, there's the familiar phrase, right? Perception is reality. Well, that phrase can be helpful in many situations. I'm, I think it's usually not true in most circumstances, if we really get down to it. Because, for instance, say if I were to hold up a photograph of the USS Yorktown right now, you would hardly be able to see it from where you sit. From your perspective, it would appear quite small, even though the ship in the picture is actually a 36,000 ton machine. Perspective is a tricky concept. And visual perspective can be altered by all sorts of factors, distance, angle, lighting, binoculars, just to name a few. I've found one of the greatest challenges of the Christian journey for me has been looking outside of my particular perspective in any number of of circumstances and situations to understand the true reality of what is going on. In Numbers 13, Moses and the Israelites are approaching the promised land. And Moses needs intel on what the land holds in store for them. So he sends some scouts out into the land to see if the people in it are few or many. If they're strong or weak, if the land is good or barren. He wants to know what they're up against. He wants to know what they're going to face when and if they enter this land. So rather than try to gauge it from far off, you know, Moses didn't have binoculars back then, um, he sends these scouts in to see what the land holds. And the scouts return with what can only be described as a bleak report, right? They return with this report to Moses and and the Israelites. The people in this land are many. The cities are well fortified. Their armies are strong. There are even giants that made us feel like grasshoppers. We couldn't possibly take this land. At least this was the report of the majority of scouts. In contrast to the majority report, though, we hear Caleb saying, let's go at once and take the land. We can surely conquer it. The difference between what the rest of the scouts say and what Caleb is saying here is pretty drastic, right? After all, did Caleb not see what they saw? Was he in a different part of the promised land than them? I mean, they were there for 40 days. Surely he saw the same things that they did. Did he not see the fortifications, the size of the armies, the size of the giants? Caleb went to the same land they did. So does he say, come on, aren't you guys exaggerating a little bit? The walls weren't really that high. I don't know about giants, you guys are just a little short. 
He doesn't say that. He doesn't correct the facts that they state about the land. He doesn't dispute any of the factual realities of their report. What he does dispute is their conclusion. Where they see certain defeat, Caleb sees a clear victory. While the other scouts are distracted by the opposition that they see in the land, Caleb remembers the God who sent them there. And the God who will go with them into the land. The same God who delivered them from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea. And provided for them and protected them throughout their journey in the wilderness. Caleb saw things as God did. And he trusted that with God, they could succeed in the task that lay before them. You know, my prayer for us is that we would all strive To have faith to see like Caleb saw. To have faith in who God was and is and is to come. That we would have this sort of vision in all aspects of our lives. Now I know that's easier said than done. And it's easy to get overwhelmed by the world and forget just how big our God is. But I want to challenge us today to have this sort of sight. God's sight in what I think is one of the most critical areas of our lives. I want to challenge us today to see ourselves as God sees us. The late David Siemens in his book, Healing for Damaged Emotions, refers to our self-image as Satan's deadliest weapon against us and against the church. He says, Satan's greatest psychological weapon is a gut-level feeling of inferiority, inadequacy, and low self-worth. Wow. I admit, I've been a victim of such a weapon on more than one occasion. Maybe you have too. You know, the enemy of our souls understands that the best way to distract us and prevent us from living out God's call in our life, is to not only distract us by the enemies in front of us, but to remind us of the enemies within us. Those feelings of inferiority and inadequacy and weakness that can so easily paralyze us from pressing on into the future God created us for. Low self-esteem, low view of ourselves hurts us in so many different ways. It paralyzes our potential. It traps us in feelings of inadequacy and insecurity and tells us we can't. In spite of all God has gifted us with and empowered us with, it prevents us from fulfilling and achieving what God has in store for us. In fact, oftentimes it prevents us from even trying. We can become so paralyzed by feelings of inadequacy that we don't even bother to try to take the first step down the road God has called us to. Because we're convinced of the inevitability of failure before we've even taken the first step. Low self-esteem also destroys our dreams. Remember the story that we just read of the scouts in the book of Numbers. It's hard to imagine a lower view of yourself than a grasshopper. These were people who had escaped slavery in Egypt, had walked through the Red Sea, had journeyed through the wilderness for years, striving to reach the land that God had promised them, the land they'd been dreaming of. But the fear of what lay before them destroyed that dream. The dream that sustained them all those years in the wilderness. I wonder, have you ever found yourself forsaking the dream that you and God have for your life because you feel like a grasshopper? A low view of ourself can also ruin our relationships. Think first of our relationship with God. You know, when we begin to think lowly of ourselves, it inevitably leads to hurting our relationship with God. Because after all, He made me, 
and I don't like me, so isn't, his, isn't it his fault that I'm this way? After all, he's the guy that made me. But even more than that, low self-esteem even ruins our relationships with others as well. You know, some of you may be tempted to think that all this talk about healing our self-esteem seems rather selfish or self-centered. But in my experience, in my experience, some of the most selfish, self-absorbed people, myself included, are people with low self-esteem. We cannot fully love others until we first have a healthy view of ourselves. We become self-absorbed with what we can't do and neglect doing what we're supposed to do. That is, love those around me and love our Creator. These are just a few of the damaging effects that low self-esteem can have on us. To understand how to heal those feelings, though, and to grow to see ourselves as God sees us, we need to understand where our self-image comes from. There are four primary sources for our self-image. The outer world, the inner world, Satan, and God. Let's break those down for a minute. First, the outer world. This encompasses all of our life experiences and circumstances. All the things that happen to us throughout our life. Our relationships with our parents, other family members, friends, and others. Whether they are good or bad, usually they're a mixture of both, right? Those are the primary source of our self-image. Especially in our formative years, they form our earliest perception of who we are. You know, often when we consider the wounds of our past and even the wounds of our present, we're quick to dismiss them and acknowledge how much better we have it than others. And at times that may be true. But I want you to hear me say this morning that whatever hurt you've experienced in your life hurts. Comparing our hurt to that of someone else's is never going to make the sting go away. It's just not going to do it. Whatever has hurt you hurts. You know, knowing that there are some who don't have parents doesn't make the hurtful things ours say hurt less. Knowing that some people can't walk doesn't help the sting of being cut from the sports team because you're not as fast as the other kids. Knowing others struggle more than us in school doesn't make the first C on our report card any less devastating. How we are treated by others, good or bad, shapes how we see ourselves. And often those experiences are hurtful. And they're as formative as they are hurtful, too. When we stop and consider the sources of our self-image, it can be truly surprising how deep the roots often run, especially when that image is a negative one. The second source I mentioned was the inner world. The inner world is what we bring to the world. Our gifts, our abilities our strengths, and our limitations. Often we come with illness of body or mind. We usually come with not only strengths, but also profound shortcomings. No two of us are alike. God made us each unique in our purpose, our giftings. All of that is as unique as we are. There is great beauty in the diversity of humanity, when we choose to see it for what it is. But you know, too often we get caught in traps of comparing ourselves to others and comparing my shortcomings to their strengths, my weaknesses to their gifts. Social media, anybody? This is toxic to our self-image and causes us to forget the strengths and gifts that we have who God created us to be, how He uniquely created each and every one of us. We forget those things when we fixate instead on what others have and we lack. 
The third source of self-image I mentioned is Satan and the lies that he speaks to us. Can I tell you, Satan's incredibly familiar with our past and with all of our inner demons and insecurities and inadequacies, and he capitalizes on every single one of them to weave lies that he sneaks into our lives to derail us from our God-given potential. Satan takes the wounds of our past, he takes our own shortcomings and all of our inner demons, and he says things like, you're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. You're small. You're weak. You're dumb. You're incompetent. You're worthless. And in our darkest seasons of life, what usually happens is we begin to believe those lies that he's speaking into our lives. We begin to think that the enemy of our souls may actually be onto something. Nothing could be further from the truth. And that's the final source and the one that has the power to truly heal us and enable us to see ourselves as God sees us. That source is God and His truth that He wants to speak over your life and mine. While Satan may know our past, God not only knows our past, He knows our present, He knows our future. Not only that, God knows our potential. God knows everything about us. Past, present, and future, and possible. Isn't that incredible? Scripture says God knit us together in our mother's womb. I just love that imagery. You know, I don't knit, but my wife does. And I'm, I'm just amazed to see what a ball of yarn can become one carefully placed needle stroke at a time. The God who created the entire universe created you. He created you one stitch at a time, one hair at a time. God created you. You are not an accident. You are not worthless. You are not incompetent. You are a child of God. God uses the good people and the good experiences of our life to nurture us and to grow us. But perhaps even more remarkable, just the way God is, is when we turn the bad stuff, the hurt and the pain and the insecurities, when we turn those things over to God, He redeems even those things for His purpose. And he'll use the hurts and insecurities and the wounds of the world to transform us and mold us and shape us into who he created and called us to be. The truth of what God sees in you is more beautiful than any lie the enemy tries to sell us. It's more beautiful than the hurts of the past. It's more beautiful than what anyone might say you know, sometimes people say, God won't give you more than you can take. And I rebuke that lie in the name of Jesus, because guess what? We have all experienced more than we can handle on our own. But I will promise you that there is nothing that the world or the enemy or even your own insecurities can throw at you that you can't overcome through the powerful love of God. So when we're faced with walls and armies, insecurities and doubts, devils and demons, anxiety and depression, maybe even giants, what will we do? Will we cower in fear and retreat into ourselves? Or will we stand tall and remember that our God is bigger, better, stronger, greater than anything life can throw our way. And more than anything, remember in all things, in all times, everywhere, God loves us. God loves me. God loves you. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy this morning. We thank you, God, for the truth that you speak into our lives, maybe even right now. The truth that we are children of God. The truth that you made us who we are. And that you love us. You cherish us as your own children. Lord, whenever the giants of this life stand in front of us and we feel like grasshoppers, God, remind us of your love, of your grace, of your purpose for our life. God, help us to be the people who you've called and created us to be. Help us to live like you love us. Help us to love ourselves and see ourselves as you see us, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.